singularity. My name is Nicola and you're watching Singularity FM, the place where we interview the future. If you guys enjoy this podcast, you can show your support by either writing a brief review on iTunes or you can simply become a patron via patreon.com forward slash singularity fm. Today, my guest on the show is Jonathan Taplin. Jonathan is the director emer emeritus of the U.S. Uh, University of Southern California Annenberg Innovation Lab and a former tour manager for Bob Dylan and the band, as well as uh, the original film producer for Martin Scorsese's Mean Streets. Jonathan started also the very first streaming video-on-demand startup called Entertainer all the way back in 1996, which is like amazing. And of course, most recently, Jonathan is the author of a very important and timely book titled Move Fast, Move Fast and Break Things, How Facebook, Google and Amazon cornered culture and undermined democracy. I just finished reading this book and I, I think it's a must read for everybody. So without further ado, welcome to Singularity FM, Jonathan. Good to be here. Fantastic. Uh, so if I were to force you to, to ask you to introduce yourself, but to force you to use one or two words, how would you do that best? Would it be a producer? Uh, an entertainer, an entrepreneur, a journalist, an academic? Well, if I had two words, I'd say author, producer. <laughs> author, producer. Okay, fantastic. And if you had a sentence or two? Well, I've had a very, as we'll see over the course of the thing, I've had a very long and very varied career. I've been... Uh, a tour manager, I've been a music producer, a film producer, an investment banker, an entrepreneur, uh, a documentary producer, an academic, uh, a professor, I've run an innovation lab, and I've been an author. So it's it's been a very crazy 50 years of, of fun. Mm -hmm. How would you want to be remembered one day? Which of those hats? Uh, I, I think that's probably up to history. I, I hope the book that I just published a year ago, which is just coming out in paperback this week, um, Move Fast and Break Things, is something I'm remembered for in the sense that it's kind of in a tradition of what in the U.S. we used to call muckraking, uh, you know, trying to <laughs> get... Uh, the society understand the big problem and, and try and delve into it. Um, I think a lot of the, the movies and music I've been associated with have been pretty amazing and will, will probably stand the test of time. Uh, and so maybe, maybe those will be the things I remember for. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, just for fun, dog person or cat person? Dog person. Why? Because I love dogs and I'm allergic to cats. <laughs> <laughs> that's good enough. Okay, that's great. So was your first love then music or film? My first love was music. You know, uh, I grew up in the early 1960s. Um, music was kind of an extraordinary part of both the culture and the politics of the time. And so I was drawn to the folk music business. And um, in that sense, you know, Bob Dylan and some of these people were, were both musical and cultural icons, but they were also political icons. Um, they were dealing with the civil rights movement, which was just in its infancy in the very early 60s. And so in that sense, that association of, politics and culture was really important. You know, today, you know, people say, shut up and dribble or, you know, things like that to people <laughs> who are either sports people or entertainers as if athletes or entertainers don't have any right to be involved in politics. And, and you know, I just disagree with that. They're citizens and they probably have as much to say about 
political things as anything else. Yeah, yeah. And how does one who is a music lover become a music producer of Bob Dylan? I mean, Bob Dylan was basically a legend at that time. I mean, he's still a legend today, but especially at that time. Well, um, I guess I was ambitious, and I also had a friend inside the business. So my brother knew somebody who was a friend of Bob Dylan's. And I went to the Newport Folk Festival in 1965 and got a backstage pass and got inside the inside. And then I was introduced to Bob Dylan's manager, Albert Grossman, and also another band that, that Albert Grossman managed called the Jim Creskin Jug Band. And so I began to work uh, with the Jug Band uh, at the Newport Folk Festival. And that happened to be the year that Bob Dylan went electric. And that was a, a very seminal moment in the history of music and certainly in the history of popular music. And it caused a big ruckus. Um, the folk music fans didn't like rock and roll. and Many people were upset and called it even a betrayal. They were very upset and they booed him off the stage. And... Um, but he continued because he knew what he wanted to do and he didn't really care what the audience thought. And so, <laughs> and that's kind of brave, you know? And so he just continued to do what he wanted to do. And, and I was lucky enough a few years later to get really involved with that when the band became his um, backup band. They were called the Hawks at that time. And, and so then I ended up, being their tour manager and then Bob and the band went out together to work and I ran those tours. And so it was just, a, it was really a magical time. And um, I just consider myself really lucky to have been there at that point uh, to be part of it. And how do you then, and why do you switch from music and someone like Bob Dylan to film and someone like Martin Scorsese? Well, um, so I worked for Dylan in the band up till 1973. And then I did the, the concert for Bangladesh for George Harrison. Um, I produced that. And wow. it just so happened that when that was over, I realized that most of the people that I wanted to work with had stopped touring. Uh, you know, Eric Clapton was sick, you know, had a heroin addiction. George Harrison couldn't really tour because people were still screaming and everything. And it, it wasn't enjoyable for someone that popular to tour. Um, Bob Dylan wasn't touring at the time. The band had stopped touring. And, and so, I just decided I'd go out to California to see what was going on uh, and maybe see if I could find an opening in the film business. And I had a friend who was a writer who said, well, when you get out to L.A., look up this kid named Marty Scorsese. He's a he's a film editor and and he edited Woodstock and he loves music. And so you guys would have a lot in common. So I got in touch with him, and I was so naive, I didn't realize you're not supposed to invest your own money into making movies. And he had a script <laughs> called Mean Streets, um, and I was taken by his student films. I loved them, and I just I got some money together, some, some of my friends, some of my own money, and we made the film for $500,000, and then it turned out to be a very successful film. And so that was very fortunate. You know, I could have ended up <laughs> dead broke, um, but it, it worked out well. And then I was a film producer. Good for you. And what a way to start film producing. Yeah, it was huh? a very good start. It was, it was pretty wonderful. Starting from the top, pretty much. Okay, so uh, who was the person who had the biggest impact on your life? I guess it was Bob Dylan. 
I mean, I think the, the it's hard now to get to understand how powerful it was that someone like Dylan was writing songs like the times they are a changing and blowing in the wind that were really kind of anthems in the culture. And, you know, it was a very utopian time. Um, the early 60s, uh, especially before most of our political heroes were assassinated, were very optimistic times. There was a sense that the world really could change and that as young people, you could be part of that change. And that something like Bob Dylan was part of that whole thing. And of course he influenced John Lennon and the Beatles to think about the role of the artists and politics and everything. And so it was all of a piece, you know, and obviously by 1968, a lot of those dreams were shattered and, you know, we, it, it didn't work out the way we had hoped, but for a, a period of time from, I would say, 61 to 68, 69, it was, it was pretty extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. So what's your biggest dream today? That's a hard one. I, I guess, you know, I'm I'm almost 71 years old. So I'm uh, I guess at this point, my hope is to stay healthy and and keep keep learning um, today. I mean, I guess I'm going to write another book. Uh, I'm I'm in the middle middle of trying to do that. And that's always a struggle in some ways. But um, I guess I also, if I was to be optimistic, I would say my hope is that the young people in America who got riled up about the gun debate, you know, and, and started to get people to demonstrate and think about taking that on, who are carrying signs that say, first we march, then we vote, my dream would be that they would actually get involved in politics and they take it seriously. Because quite frankly, when you look at the charts, old people vote at like 60 to 70 percent range and young people vote at like 20 percent. And if young people voted as much as old people voted, then we wouldn't have a bunch of old farts like me running the country. You know, we'd have young people running the country and that to me would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. And what's your biggest fear then on the flip side of that coin? Well, my fear is that we have a, a kind of authoritarian president who, you know, really wants to drastically change the whole nature of democracy. And unfortunately, he has the tools to do that as, you know, that's partially what my book is about in the sense that, you know, we've never had a media system that was so uncontrolled. And so the fact that somebody can get access to 2 billion people on Facebook and use propaganda to uh, completely distort the truth. I don't think that's ever existed. I mean, obviously, in the 30s, Hitler had control of the national radio in Germany. And so he could, he could use propaganda pretty effectively. And film was a big part of it, actually. Lenny Reisenfeld did some and film, amazing Nazi right. propaganda. You're totally films. right. Um, so we could use the tools of the government to do that. But I don't even think he had as much ability to reach people as somebody who can use Facebook to get to almost everybody in the country. 
um, and get to them in a time when they're rather vulnerable. I mean, one of the things we really learned about in terms of trying to understand Facebook is that oftentimes the the kind of Cambridge Analytica propaganda that was used would would essentially scrape the comments of people who were writing things about, oh, I'm angry about the immigrants or something, and then just reflect them back to them so that, you know, they the Trump campaign would sometimes put up out 40,000 different versions of an ad that were kind of customized towards the mindset of the people that they were directed to. You could never do that with a broadcast medium, obviously, but you could do that with Facebook and you could do that with Twitter. And that to me seems a very dangerous aspect of life that I don't think people really understand. Mm -hmm. And hence you wrote this Fantastic book that, again, I recommend people check out because it's very important and it's a vital conversation that we must have not only in the United States, but here in Canada and ac across the world. Um, again, the book is called Move Fast and Break Things, How Facebook, Google and Amazon Cornered Culture and Undermined Democracy. So let's start with the book here. What is sort of the thesis? What is your thesis in your book? Well, the thesis is that the the initial idea for the internet was to decentralize culture, to decentralize media. And when the internet was being invented in the late 1960s, the media, both in Canada and the United States, was very centralized. In the United States, there were three television networks and there was one newspaper in any city and that basically that was the media other than some magazines and stuff and so the idea that you would have this very decentralized media in which any citizen could communicate with anybody else seemed to be a really radical and wonderful and utopian idea and, and it was utopian in the sense that people like Stuart Brand and Ken Kesey were involved in it these were Countercultural freaks, right? These were people who run, you know, acid tests at night in in the Avalon Ballroom in San Francisco with three thousand people taking LSD and listening to the Grateful Dead. And then in the daytime, they would build this network called the Whole Earth Electronic Link, which was one of the very first internet networks. But what happened was that in twenty years or so a group of young people came out of Stanford and other universities like Larry Page, who runs Google now, and Peter Thiel, who was the first investor in Facebook and owned PayPal, and Jeff Bezos, who runs Amazon. And they, they were schooled in a very libertarian school of thought, which comes out of a, a writer named Ayn Rand. And Ayn Rand... You know, her novels, there's always a hero who's brought down by democracy, which the mob doesn't understand their genius and just gets in their way. And that's really what Peter Thiel and these people believe. They believe that democracy, as Thiel said, democracy and capitalism are incompatible. I have to agree with him on that, <laughs> so only not from exactly the point of view he means, but... Yeah, well, I mean, he really believed that if, if capitalists really want to make things happen, they need to get rid of government control. And so on his most radical way, Thiel suggested that you put your company on what he called a seastead, that is a platform, like an offshore oil platform, you build your whole company and all your buildings on that in the middle of the ocean, far away from any control of any government. Of course, he couldn't get anybody to go live on one of those platforms. It didn't really work out very well. But the ideas behind it, he continued to, to push forward. And 
his understanding and that of Page and Bezos was that the internet, instead of being a decentralized network, could be an extraordinarily centralized network in which winner could take all. In other words, that you could have one search engine that because of the network scale and the effect and Metcalf's law could service everybody. And you would have one everything store, which is what Amazon is called, that gave that gave you everything in the e-commerce world and, and you did, wouldn't need a second one. And eventually you'd have one social network company like Facebook. Even though it owned Instagram and WhatsApp, it, it really completely dominated the business, the social network business. And to do that, basically, they believed that you had to have a business in which there was no government regulation, there was no taxes, so Amazon could sell books and not have to pay sales taxes and put 4,000 bookstores out of business in the United States. And that's true not, to, not only of books, by the way, but pretty much everything that Amazon sold to out-of-state people right. and et cetera. Basically, they, you paid no tax. Right. And then there would be no copyright. So YouTube basically says to the music business, your content is going to be on YouTube whether you want it to or not. So you have to just decide, do you want this little bit of advertising money we're going to dribble out to you? And if so, sign this quote-unquote license. It's not really a license. It's like an extortion scheme. And, and then finally, that there would be no competition. As Peter Thiel said, competition is for losers. If you really want to build a great company, you have to build a monopoly. And that's exactly what these guys did. I mean, Google is a monopoly. It has 90% market share in, in search advertising. Um, certainly, Amazon has a monopoly on the book business and is beginning to grow monopolies in other sectors. Uh, and certainly, Facebook has over 75% of all mobile social traffic. And so that would constitute a monopoly too. And so that the effect of that, of course, was that for the music business, for instance, revenue has fallen by 75% since the internet really became a power. Um, in journalism, newspaper revenue since Google arrived have fallen by 80%. Uh, there are 50% fewer people working as professional journalists than there were, you know, 10 years ago. The same is true of the book business. Let me just take exception with, with one, one case here, though. Because, and I know your book came out a year and a half ago, but the numbers have changed since, I think. So, for example, <clears throat> let me find it here. Last year, uh, 2017, global recorded music revenues reached $17.4 billion dollars putting it just a hair below the 2008 17.7 billion in revenues and we see that rising yeah but but in 2000 the, okay but in 2000 the revenues were in the 25 billion dollar range right and in in another 5 or 6 years we would be above that probably in in the best of all possible worlds maybe that's true and i look i'm optimistic that the music business will find its way out of it. But that doesn't say anything against the fact that the music business was totally decimated by the internet. Um, yes, it's beginning to come back. And if we could get YouTube out of the picture, it would come back a lot because then people would actually pay for music through Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, those kinds of things. As long as YouTube is out there, in which every single song in the world is available for free, those services will never get to the level that they should. Well, I'll, I'll come back to that, but let me focus for now on the, the main ideas in your book. And you've brought it in like two major uh, impact zones, if I can call it this way. One is like culture and the other is democracy. So let's talk about culture first. So 
tell me how Facebook, Google, and Amazon are bad for, or, or to be uh, exactly specific and quote you, cornered culture. What do you mean by that? So what happened essentially was that maybe on the order of $50 billion worth of revenue was reallocated from the people who made content to the people who provided the portal to which you found content. So what happens is if, if, if my way of finding music, journalism, books, whatever, is through one of these three giant portals, they essentially take most of the advertising revenue that might have fallen to, say, newspapers before. If you, it's certainly in the United States, I don't know about Canada, but if you go around to any major city in the United States... It's more or less the same. We're almost the same economy, very close. So if you go to almost any major city, the local newspaper is hanging on by a thread. It has almost no advertising revenue anymore. And, you know, for some reason, newspapers bought into the idea that somehow all these new people who would come to their content, which they were going to give away for free on the Internet, would somehow become important customers. And it never turned out that way. So Facebook and Google... How is that a bad thing then? So let's say, uh, let's say we agree that they have, quote, cornered the market because they're so big that they're like 70-80% market share in most of those areas, right? Someone would say, well, look, this is... Those are natural monopolies. And if you look at the prices of books and the prices of this, that, and the other thing, like video production, video publication, book authorship, book dissemination, you know, everything has gone down. So the, the barriers to entry to a startup YouTube artist, to a startup music artist, to a startup book author have never been lower than they are now. And also on the consumer end of things, the prices that we're paying are supposedly lower than they've ever been. Because, quote, they pass the savings to the consumer, supposedly, and therefore it's a win-win scenario, isn't it? Or that's the claim anyway. First off, the barriers to entry in, say, the movie business or the television business, the prices haven't gone down at all. I mean, if, if Shonda Rhimes, probably the most important producer for ABC television, now moves herself over to Netflix, she's not going to make a one-hour show for less than she made for Netflix, uh, that for ABC. I mean, so that's, that's a total myth. There is no productivity gain to be gained by having some kind of digital production of television or movies. Um, and quite frankly, if you look at the video game business, it gets more expensive every year to produce a big hit video game. So the same kind of gigantic winner-takes-all economics play out in the TV business, the movie business, the video game business. Now, the music business is different in the sense that a band can potentially produce their own record in their basement using Pro Tools and a, a good, you know, Macintosh computer. Uh, but if you look at the music business, last year, 80% of the revenue went to 1% of the product. When I was in the music business in the 70s, 80% of the revenue went to 20% of the product. So all you're doing is you're, you're actually making Jay-Z and Beyonce and Taylor Swift and Adele richer, but the average musician is hardly making a living at all. In fact, the average band has to tour 200 days a year to stay alive. Now, to, for you to tell me that, for you to tell me that in 
in an age when there is 5 billion of these devices out in the world, that the only way I can make a living is by getting you in the same room, physical space with me, locking the door and making you pay to get in the room to hear my music. That's just insane. That's like stupid. So, I mean, none of that makes any sense. You know, YouTube says, okay, we're a huge benefit to culture because we're making this tool of distribution available to anyone. I would argue to you that the quality of the content that's come out of YouTube, whether it's PewDiePie playing video games while you watch him play video games, or, or you know, someone showing you how to do your eyebrows better, uh, it's not changing the, it doesn't even pass the who cares test, 90% of it. So I, I, I don't believe this nonsense that there's some kind of great democratic, brilliant distribution that is bringing wonderful content forward to the world. If, if you quite honestly, if you look at it, you know, there's this famous theory called the million monkeys theory. It's essentially if a million monkeys were given typewriters or computers, they would eventually type Hamlet, Shakespeare's Hamlet. Well, okay, so there's 400 hours of content uploaded to YouTube every minute. Where is the Francis Coppola or the Martin Scorsese to emerge from that world? He doesn't exist. Well, I would say there's been tremendous examples of people doing like a short video or a pilot. Uh, and particularly, I, I'm aware of a number of, let's say, sci-fi flicks that came out uh, from nowhere. People basically produced them almost in their bathroom or something. And then they got picked up by a big studio for multi-million dollar deals. Uh, I know. Tell of, me you one. Know, many... Well... I have published a number of them uh, on my actually on my blog. Uh, so um, I think that's a myth. You know, uh, I can go and I'll put a link to to some of them in the in the show footnotes. But there, there were a, a, one was changing skin or something like that, and the other one was called Envoy. Uh, okay, but but let's be serious. They don't. They don't move the meter compared to the latest Avengers Marvel movie. They're 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 like a, a tiny infinitesimal amount of the audience thing. I mean, so let's let's not have any illusions that there's some brilliant renaissance of culture coming from YouTube. It's nonsense. YouTube is. Uh, you know, quite frankly, the cover of last week's Business Week was a garbage dump with the sign YouTube on it. YouTube is a garbage dump, mostly, with 44,000 ISIS videos full of beheadings, plenty of videos of pedophiles. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's not contributing to the culture. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, Robert McKee, uh, for example, says that we'll come back to the YouTube uh, argument, but Robert McKee says that TV is in a golden age right now because the stories are better than they've ever been. The, the writing is better than it's ever been. The production value has been better than it's ever been. The length of the stories has gone now beyond the, the dreams of anyone ever possible. Uh, and it's a golden age of, of... It has nothing to do with the Internet. I promise you. It has nothing to do with the Internet. Yes, Netflix is a distribution medium, and Amazon is a distribution medium, and some of this TV is coming out on those two platforms. But Netflix is paying, you know, a million dollars an episode for a piece of TV. That's no different than what ABC television is paying. This is not because 
of some brilliant new do-it-yourself economics on the internet. That's, that's complete nonsense. It's big studios, big world-class talent producing great stuff. And it just so happens that there is a little bit wider range of material that you can do, which is allowing lots of things to happen. Well, uh, and as far as YouTube goes, I, I want to go back to it lately, uh, later, but just to give you an example what someone wrote on my YouTube channel some time ago, they wrote, when I had only 15,000 subscribers, now I have about 21,000 subscribers, he said, 14,960 subscribers for one of the most intelligent, amazing and important channels on the net. There is no chance for humanity. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's because, and when I went to the YouTube uh, meetup here in Toronto, I was the oldest guy, first of all, and second of all, all the other ones were either gamers or makeup <laughs> or comedians, <laughs> pretty much. Anyway, so be that as it may be, I do still that there's lots of new conversations that are happening that are not happening before. And just to challenge you a little bit on the music front of things too, I'm going to give you some specific numbers here. In Norway, Norwegian musicians' income has gone up by 70% in the exact period that you're talking about, 1999 to 2009, while at the same time record sales have declined by 50%. So income has increased for them on average by 136% for that 10-year period. Does that include their concert income? Of course. Uh, so concert income, also uh, collection organization income, uh, stipends from the government, the number of registered active musicians has also quadrupled, uh, not quadrupled, uh, increased by 28% a quarter during this period. And all of those figures, by the way, have been adjusted for inflation. So this is just to say that it's not necessarily that uh, the internet has destroyed um, uh, the music business. I would say the music business has destroyed its music, the music business. And if I love your book, it's a fantastic book and it's a great conversation, but I honestly don't see a difference between the music business and Google, Amazon and Facebook, to be honest with you. And I can give you hundreds of examples of how they've threatened me and mistreated me without any cause of, of, or concern whatsoever, because I've never used anyone's material ever in my life. Uh, and I can give you specific examples later about that if we want to talk. But the point I'm trying to make is that if even if you look at sales of music industry now, they have skyrocketed. If you look at it... Um, uh, people making money now and before. Alanis Morissette's lawyer said that before 2009, the, the average that the musician was making from the music business was $600 a year. The average musician. Now, yes, there were somebody like your friend who had throat cancer who was making 100000 a year, but the average was six, $600. And today, if you look, I'm looking at the website, by the way, called here... Um, Statista.com, and if you look at the global box uh, office revenues, global cinema advertising expenditure, including even people hired in the movie business, right, from 2000 to 2017, everything is highly on the rise. So, for example, in 2001, we had 370,000 people roughly uh, employed in the United States in the movie business. Today, we have over 400,000 people. So it's not, I think, uh, so all of your arguments stay as far as culture in general go and as, as far as uh, democracy goes in my book. And they're very, very vitally important. And we saw the worst results of that, or so far anyway, in the election. I agree with you entirely. But I wouldn't agree to say that, you know, it's a matter of copyright. I would say that if you think it's a matter of copyright, you're basically going to be shifting money from the pockets of the Facebook investors to the pockets of the investors in Sony and the big record labels. That's all, because the 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 record year that we had in 2017 of, of uh, money making in the music industry didn't translate to musicians at all. And the question then is, where does the money go? Okay, so uh, 
as as you know, if you read my book, I'm talking about a period in the '60s and '70s where the middle, what I call the middle class artists, could really make a living. And the point of that was the following: first off, record companies did not advance a lot of money for recording costs, so maybe. Maybe a recording costs fifty thousand dollars to make a record. Artists got paid a good royalty that was between a dollar and a two dollars per record, and so you could easily recoup the recording costs with fifteen to twenty thousand albums sold, and after that, you were making between a dollar and two dollars per album every single album you sold. So that so that you could make a very good living selling two or three hundred thousand albums. That's the way the band Canadian absolutely made a living. absolutely yeah. There's and it no wasn't doubt. this notion that the record companies were ripping off the artists is total nonsense. It, I, I was there. I I would collect the checks. I saw how the artists were living. So. And I also saw post 2000, post Napster, how that just stopped, how the record royalties just came. So why didn't it stop in Norway, for example? And why did musicians there have increased well, their revenue? Well, nobody by... was making a living in, in Norway, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, and, and then it went from a, a zero basis to something. And And by the way, the fact that you know, Skype, I mean, uh, you know, Spotify and these companies were based in those countries. They were really interested in getting local artists on the things at the first because that's how they got started. And so clearly, look, I I'm, I'm believe that streaming revenues could make for a very healthy music business. If you think about this, as I said, there are 5 billion smartphones in the world. If I could sell something for 50 cents to 5% of those devices, that's like $150 million. You know, it's like ridiculous, right? So, I mean, the point is that the law of large numbers argues that there should be a fabulous business for everybody in the digital age. Now, whether we can do that in the face of YouTube, just basically taking everybody's content and putting it up and, and saying tough bananas, you know, there's no way you can get it off here because we have, you know, we have this thing called safe harbor. And I don't think your audience really understands it. This is not a copyright issue. I'm not trying to be, you know, say that Larry Lessig is an idiot. What this is, is a misuse of a digital millennium law that was put up that gave these companies, specifically YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, complete safe harbor that nobody could ever sue them for anything that was on that content. So that's why there, when I started researching my book, there were 44,000 ISIS videos on YouTube. And the only reason YouTube began to take those off was when Procter & Gamble discovered that its ads were running on the front of beheading videos. And so what was YouTube's response to that? Oh. We'll demonetize this content. In other words, they left them up there. They just said, we won't put ads on there. And by the way, I could never get a straight answer from YouTube as to whether the advertising that was on the front of those ISIS videos, whether that money was going to ISIS or was it going to YouTube? You know, that, that's how crazy the whole situation was. Yeah, usually it's some kind of a sharing, right? So just like when I'm a YouTuber, I post a video, 
YouTube takes like 70 or 80 percent or whatever it may be. They take the lion's share by far. Right. And then I take a tiny little bit as the content creator, of course. And this is how it works. So I imagine both of those so, two, which, of course, this. is precisely your point. Think about this. If you had a tune, a song that was very popular, and you could get a million downloads on iTunes, you could make $900,000. If you had a million streams on YouTube, you would make $900. I have 2.5 million downloads on iTunes uh, and 2.5 million views on YouTube. On iTunes, I've made nothing. On YouTube, I've made about $2,300. <laughs> well, I don't know why you've made no money on iTunes. Are you giving it away for free? <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that's your choice. Yeah, that's my podcast. Okay, is so you, for you free just free. decided not to make people pay yeah, for it. Yeah, it's, it's a free podcast. Anyway, so, okay, so let's talk a little bit about rent-seeking enterprises because I want to I wanna give you that opportunity to tell us how they, they have sort of not only cornered culture, but how this is bad for us at the global level and how... The worst if effect even of that is undermining democracy. Okay, so these two things are, are linked in the sense that what is the product that Facebook produces? The product is you. The pro and you spend an hour a day, if you're an average citizen, working for Facebook to produce that product. That is to refine an advertising profile of you that can be sold to 2 billion people and, and sold to marketers who want to reach 2 billion people. So essentially, Facebook extracts what economists call premium rents from advertisers because it knows more about you. Not only does it know what music you like, where you've traveled, you know, what your religious affiliation is, what everything about you, but it also can reach you at a very moment of your most vulnerable. So you have a, a horrible day and you write to a friend on Facebook, what a bad day, this really sucks. And Facebook knows that that's the place where you're most vulnerable to the thing that maybe they know that you've been looking at a pair of shoes for the past three weeks. Or they send me a pizza, pizza banner for a pizza delivery. Whatever they're going to send it to you at just that moment when you're feeling low with the hope that you'll think, well, maybe this will make me feel better if I buy this pizza or I buy these shoes, right? Okay, so then you take that and you convert that into thinking about politics. So if I want to, for instance, suppress the vote of young African-Americans who live in Michigan, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. All I have to do is create an ad that says, Hillary Clinton thinks all young black men are super predators, which was an actual quote of hers. And should be locked for life or something like that, yeah. And send that only to young black men. Right? No white people are going to see that ad. Or send the Bernie Sanders supporters how crooked Hillary manipulated and how the Democratic Party is like preset so that Bernie can never win or something like that, so that you demotivate them to vote. The point is to demotivate the voter to think, oh, all these politicians are the same. There's no point of voting. And essentially, it works really well. It's astonishingly how well it works. And if you look at the change between, you know, Hillary Clinton and Obama, it was the drop in voter participation 
among young people, especially young people of color, uh, that made all the difference in those three states and that made the difference for Donald Trump to win. So I, I believe, quite honestly, that this is not just a danger around elections. For instance, when this school shooting happened in Parkland in Florida five weeks ago, within hours, there were up on YouTube and up on Facebook hundreds of stories that these kids were just actors, that this didn't actually happen, and this was all a fake. The whole thing was a fake. And not only were these posted by people like Infowars and Gateway Pundit and places like that, but because they know how to work the algorithms and because they had access to hundreds of thousands of bots, they would hit these posts with bots, which make them very popular, and then they go right to the top of the search algorithm for Google that goes to the top of the trending topics on Facebook and the top of the search box in YouTube. And if you search for Parkland school shooting on YouTube, the first two pages of returns would all be propaganda conspiracy theories that were total lies. You could not find the truth on YouTube if you wanted to. But it also depends because they are individualizing the search engine, right? So when I search something, my first result is different than your first result because Google knows who is searching. So they already take into consideration your personal uh, history that, that may be and true, your personal but it's preferences. Still, if, if I'm someone who is essentially liberal and was searching for Florida school shooting, I would still see the conspiracy videos. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not got anything really to do. I mean, it's got to do with overwhelming the algorithms, which is what right. Cambridge Analytica, Steve Bannon, all these people really understood how to do. And by the way, the people who run the web services for Infowars and Gateway Pundit are really good at it too. And the same people that are running the Internet Research Bureau out of St. Petersburg in Russia are very good at it as well. Right. A couple of weeks ago, I interviewed Sean Gorley, who is this brilliant young mathematician and founder of two companies called Quit and Primer, the first one funded by Peter Thiel, by the way, who, uh, and he said that what Cambridge Analytica does is like basic stuff compared to what they do. <laughs> so he's boasting, he's boasting that he can, he can propagandize even more he wasn't boasting, and he, he was just saying in terms of capability in a sort of even modest way in a way, but he was also not a supporter of Cambridge Analytica and what people have done. And yet, his first company started with Peter Thiel giving him two and a half million dollars, and and his biggest uh, uh, contractor clients now are de uh, defense contractors usually. And InQtel was a major investor in his second startup and and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a very, very nice guy. You can still, uh, look for him. He's uh, on uh, TED. I, I understand. You know, Peter Thiel is, is selling his Palantir software to many police departments all over the country. And essentially, it's a version of, of Steven Spielberg's Minority Report. Well, Palantir is basic compared to, to Primer and Quid. They're like the next level up. Palantir is bigger in terms of sales because it's like, a you know, he has like $800 million contracts with just the army or something like that, right? But in terms of capability, they're more into the visualization, whereas this guy, basically his AI reads and writes and congests and translates at the same time from, let's say, North Korean or what have you. Yeah, but, but let's be clear. This is not going to help you in terms of your freedom. Peter Thiel is really big in freedom, theoretically. He wants freedom for, every, for himself 
he certainly doesn't want freedom of the press if you write something against him like Gawker did. He'll put you out of business. And he doesn't want freedom for black people in, in Detroit because he's got this pre-crime system that essentially pulls people over because they think they have a propensity committed a crime. So, I mean, let's, let's be clear. Peter Thiel is out for one thing only, money. There is this uh, fantastic documentary on Netflix now called Nobody Speak, which kind of documents uh, the, the Gawker case, the Hulk Hogan versus Gawker case very well. And as far as the original quote that you start the book with, and you mentioned today between uh, democracy and capitalism, of course, Peter Thiel is on the side of capitalism there. I would agree with him, but only on the other side, that that will be on democracy, that when you have those large monopolies like Google, Amazon, and Facebook, I would say democracy is not possible. So I agree with him in that sense, only my argument, like yours, I believe, would be that we have to, we ought to break them down and we right. have to be careful so that we don't get our democracy hijacked, whereas his argument is, let's break democracy because it's impeding on our exactly. capitalist monopolies. Exactly. <laughs> okay, well, so... Um, let me talk about, so let's say if we agree with what's happening, right? And I've documented like my article about this and I've been doing interviews on this topic for some time now. Then what is to be done? So let's say we have the diagnosis. Then what do we do about this? Well, I mean, my take is there are three things we have to do. First is we need to have good privacy legislation. So, um... On May 25th, the European Union is going to put into place something called GDPR, General Data Privacy Regulation. And it will, in theory, say that I can be on Facebook and let Facebook only know my age, my sex, and where I live, and my real name, right? And I can ask Facebook to purge every other piece of information about me that they have and not collect anything new. And you can also ask Google to delete. I can, I can be forgotten. I have the right to be forgotten. Right. That would be a major change. Now, look, we all know that Google and Facebook will try and game the system and trick you into giving them consent to collect the information. And I saw Wired Magazine has a very kind of amusing article about how Facebook is presenting your choices on your smartphone to opt into this new GDPR system. And all the, the choices to say, yes, I allow you to, to take my information as you always have are really big. And down in the tiniest little type that's almost grayed out on the bottom is says, see other options. <laughs> so, I mean, they're basically <laughs> trying to make it almost impossible for you to find the other options, which is ways that you can be on the system without being surveilled. Because as I make it clear in my book, the business of Google, Facebook, and Amazon is surveillance capitalism. And not content just to use the smartphone is the way to surveil you. Now, of course, every one of them is trying to put this smart speaker into your house, which is really just a smart microphone, whether it's the Amazon Alexa or the Google Home. And Facebook was going to announce one last week. It's just that because of the privacy issues, they thought that was probably bad timing to announce a new surveillance product for you. But they'll announce it in a few weeks once the heat is off. Um, so those things are always on. Those microphones are always listening, always. And, there's, you know, they, they want you to believe that you have to say something to it. Alexa, what is the score uh, of the hockey match? But that's not true. The microphone is always on. Needless to say, obviously, or it would never hear the word Alexa. Right. So um, what it's doing is trying to pick up keywords and keywords is the key to the 
advertising world of the future, which is, I know you like bourbon. I know you want to buy a, a truck. I know you want to go to the Caribbean, whatever. So, I mean, these are the basic problems that we're, we're facing. So first we need privacy legislation. The second thing is we probably need to look at this issue that I raised before, which is called the safe harbor. So we have to think about, do they really, are they really this completely neutral pipe that is not trying to filter anything? Because that's the notion of safe harbor. Like Verizon or Bell Canada are, are neutral pipes, right? They don't, they never filter anything on your phone calls or any of the bits that flow through their pipes. So they... They actually down throttle okay. sometimes. Okay. That, that's a whole but, other issue. But, you know, YouTube obviously filters out porn, right? It has very good artificial intelligence algorithms. When you're trying to un up upload porn to YouTube, and lots of people are trying it every single day, it sees a bare breast and it shunts it into a separate queue. And then a human looks at it and says, no, that's porn and puts it in the trash. Occasionally, it turns out that's a National Geographic film and they allow it to go on. Right. OK. So that's the second issue that has to be looked at, safe harbor. And then the third question is, are these companies too big? Do they need to be broken up? And that's probably an issue that in my book, I don't come down one side or another on the issue. I suggest that it may be something we have to think about. And quite honestly, it would not be that hard to do. It wouldn't be hard to say to Facebook, you have to spin off Instagram and WhatsApp and make them companies that compete with Facebook. And maybe if the three of them were competing, one of them would offer you a service that wasn't based on surveillance. And maybe that would be a good thing. That would be a, a marketing plus, right? Um, maybe Google would have to spin off YouTube. Right. I, I agree with you on number one and on number three, 100%. Um, uh, and in fact, I would say that it's, uh, I, I would say, it's obvious to me that they are monopolies and it's obvious to me that, for example, when Amazon decides now to go into Whole Food, they would dominate. Eventually, it would go into retail, into their own production lines, whether it's for fashion, whether it's for food, whether it's for what have you. They would always have that monopoly because they're coming as a monopoly from another industry and they have all that power behind them. And the more industry they become monopoly, in the more industry they can become monopoly again in two, right. right? When they enter, because that's that's how it works. Uh, so so I agree with you entirely on point one and point three. Let's talk a little bit about on point two. How do you enforce safe harbor? Because here's my concern with that. So first of all, that my concern is that you're helping them become and stay monopolists. Because let's say right now, that system that you're talking about costs hundreds of millions of dollars because it involves very sophisticated AI and it involves thousands of people who need to be hired to be then the final filter of these videos, which means that you cannot ever have a startup company that can ever properly start competing with YouTube if that's a necessity. And in that way, you're going to be creating barriers to entry. But what's my personal concern as a, as a, as a blogger and a podcaster is that, look, I have 2.5 million views on YouTube. I've had the best intention for years to basically sanitize all my comment section on all my YouTube videos for the first two or three years. And I was doing a good job for a long time. After a certain point, it became absolutely impossible. Like it literally, and I'm a one guy shop. Like I don't have anybody. So, and if someone posts a comment on my blog or on my new, my YouTube channel, and that links to a pirated site or video or a piece of music or book or what have you picture, I would then be liable. But I cannot do that. What, what I cannot go filter two and a half million views. So what do we do with that? So I, I see what you're talking about. 
I think the kind of rules that I'm talking about should really only apply to the giant platforms. You know, and, and quite honestly, if you listen to what the head of YouTube and what Mark Zuckerberg are saying, they're spending a lot of money hiring people to monitor content. Right. Tens of thousands. Yeah. And they're spending a lot of money on artificial intelligence to try and weed out bad stuff. Right. And quite frankly, they're getting better at it. There's very little porn on Facebook. There's very little porn on YouTube. There's, there's less ISIS content on Twitter than there used to be. And there's less pirated links on Google search engines than ever. Right. So they have a specific responsibility, it seems to me, if you have a platform that has 2 billion users, you have a responsibility. You're a, you're a large thing. If you're a startup with 21,000 subscribers, I don't see how you can meet that same barrier. But quite frankly, you're using the big platforms anyway as your distribution media. I think I, I get about 40% to 50% of my traffic as organic traffic. But you're still placing it on YouTube or Apple, right? Of course. Of okay, course. so they're... Those big platforms are still your distribution platform. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so they're they're ones they're the ones that are going to have to be responsible for monitoring the comments and stuff like that. Okay, that that's not a bad idea actually. I like that to the degree that that they can filter that. But and the other thing is the the liability. Let's talk a little bit about the SOP and PIPA. Do you think they were like big outcry over that? And and I want to see where you're going to come out on that because I was strongly against. Well, I, I think those were misplaced pieces of legislation. Because at least in spirit, what you're saying is that we need something like SOPA and PIPA. No, I'm saying, you know, no, I, I basically, I'm not worried so much about piracy. I really think piracy is not, that big an issue anymore. I'm much more worried about YouTube. In other words, I'm worried about legitimate places which are trying to use Safe Harbor to get around having to pay for content. And to me, that's that's problematic. You know, I mean, the Kim.coms of the world are going away. People already know that you go on these BitTorrent sites you get lots of viruses, and it's just a big hassle. And by the way, the original reason behind a lot of piracy was that there wasn't a legitimate way to get all the music in the world uh, on legitimate sites. On Spotify's ad-supported site, in which everything is free, you pretty much every piece of music that ever existed in the world is there. So it's not as if you have some excuse to go to a pirate site. So, I mean, so, I mean, my only problem in the music business right now is to get YouTube to play like a legitimate, the way Spotify does. If, if YouTube bought the same licenses that Spotify did for ad supported content, I'd be happy. I wouldn't have any beef against them at all, but they refuse to do that. You see, I, I agree with that, and I'm happy that you're putting less stress the, uh, on piracy today than maybe some of the videos that I watched of you speaking two or three or several years ago. And that's just because I, I began to understand that the music business had clearly changed in the last three or four years. And by the way, you know, everybody can see that Streaming volume is growing 70% year over year. It's huge. And the profits of those places are growing, but it's not converting into, into money for artists. It will begin to. I hope so. And, and I have other, other concerns that the way it's organized right now, let me give you a couple of egregious examples. 
So the, the old school example was, I'm originally from Bulgaria. I buy a DVD from Bulgaria, come here in Canada or vice versa, and I can't watch it. Perfect, you know, I spent my 20 bucks on that DVD. I go put it in the DVD player in Canada and I can't play it or in Bulgaria. Why? Because they put this stupid thing called digital original coding. And that goes under the, the, the name of DRM. But recently, just two or three weeks ago, something really egregious happened. So I, I was interviewing someone else just like you. Her name is PJ Manny and she has her book in audio form on a CD available on Amazon. So she sent me a copy of her book as a CD. I take that CD and I put it in my computer. And I was like, well, I want to listen to this when I'm in the gym. It's like a 12-hour book or 10-hour book or something. I want to do it in the car, in the gym. I want to, you know, utilize my time. I can't just sit on my computer for 12 hours. So I ripped the CD off and I put it on my phone. And it tells me, this is a pirate file. You're not allowed to play this file on your phone. And it's a perfectly legitimate copy that the author herself sent me from Amazon directly. And I'm not even allowed to do that. And, and that's the reason many times people are forced into pir piracy, by the way. And there's even much worse than that because is to in order to do that, to use those uh, DRM protections and to know that I've taken a file from here and put it there, they actually have to have a root underlying software that always double checks what the owner of the computer does. Okay, let, let me just warn you that we have four minutes. So, so uh, where can people find more about you and your work? So, uh, johntaplin.com, J-O-N-T-A-P-L-I-N.com. Um, the book is available everywhere, including on Amazon. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm I, actually I'm going to be in Toronto tomorrow speaking at the uh, Canadian Music Convention, you know, Canadian Music Week, uh, actually on Wednesday morning. I'm, I'm giving the keynote address. <laughs> That's hilarious. If I knew I would have done this interview in person with you, Jonathan. Uh, we actually have more time doing it on Skype. Okay, so what's the most important thing? We, we had a kind of a conversation that kind of went off the script that I was hoping I could, I could take us towards, but it's a failure on me entirely today, probably. What is the most important thing that you want our viewers and listeners to take away from this conversation with you today? I would say that the, the world has been directed by what I call techno-determinists for the last 10 to 15 years. That is, billionaires who run technology companies who are fully confident that they know exactly how the world should work. And the, all I'm asking is that we slow down a little bit because these same people are bringing you artificial intelligence, robotics, all sorts of things, which you may find in 10 years put you out of work, uh, make your life less wonderful than than you know the the illusion that these people are selling you and so as a society i just want us to have a conversation about where technology is taking us and we have to be careful and remember that these three companies google amazon and facebook will not only rule the businesses that are in now but will rule many other businesses because they have the artificial intelligence systems. They have all the data on billions of people. And as you know, the economist said, data is the new oil. And that ability will allow them to spread their tentacles into many, many other businesses, whether it's healthcare, transportation, other things. And if the politicians are completely asleep and don't regulate these businesses, don't watch over these businesses, we're going to find ourselves in 10 or 15 years in a situation where these businesses are, are even more control over society than they are now. Well, Jonathan Taplin, thank you very much for being with us today. It's been great to talk to you. 
a good conversation. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes, or you can simply make a donation. Thank <laughs> you.